evening. Um, welcome and, and thank you for joining us today on, on this webinar on defending our lands, territories, and resources amid the COVID-19 pandemic, which is for our, the launch of our annual report on criminalization of, of and violence and impunity against indigenous peoples. Uh, before starting, just a few housekeeping uh, announcements. Translation is available. Uh, you may choose your language um, below in the in the um, on, on Zoom on the Zoom program, and we have interpretation available in English, French, Russian, and Spanish. Um, in addition, I kindly would like to ask the um, attendees to uh, introduce themselves via the chat. Uh, the chat box on, on the program, um, just letting us know your name, your organization, and where you come from. In addition, uh, we'll have our uh, Q&A section at the end of the, um, of the webinar. So please make sure if you have any questions, we'll be taking note of them, but also you can raise your hand at the, during the Q&A section. And before starting the panel and introducing our moderator, we at Indigenous Peoples' Rights International would like to call for the attention in the escalation of violence against Indigenous peoples in Colombia. Uh, just last week, an Indigenous governor, Sandra Peña, was murdered. And in a March called for, um, in relation to her murder, at least 22 Indigenous persons were also wounded uh, during this march, and a few were also imprisoned. So in, since the, um, the signing of the peace accord in Colombia, already over 1,150 human rights defenders in Colombia have been murdered. And just with uh, Sandra Peña's uh, murder, it's 52 of them that have been murdered this year. So we would like to stress and call for solidarity and, and to pressure on this situation so that we can um, change this reality for our brothers and sisters in Colombia. And I would also um, now like to introduce our, our moderator, um, Vicky Tauli Corpus. Uh, she is a former chairperson of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and also the um, former United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, Vicky, along with uh, Joanne Carling, are the co-founders of Indigenous Peoples Rights International. And um, the floor is yours, Vicky. I think it's on mute. I even, yeah, I'm sorry. Good evening, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, it's uh, we are all in different time zones, so we will cover the whole day and night. And uh, as you know, this event is being done uh, in conjunction with the session of the 20th session, I think, of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. And uh, I was asked to help uh, moderate this, but I would like to say at the outset that at some point I will disappear and give the moderation to uh, Joanne because I'm also speaking in another side event organized by the FAO. But uh, anyhow, I'll do my role in terms of giving a brief uh, welcome to you all and also a little background on, on, on this event. This event, uh, as I mentioned by Alang Kai, is an event that will uh, be used to present the annual report of IPRI. Since we started, we thought that it would be a good idea to gather uh, information around a particular theme. You know, of course, the theme that overarches everything is criminalization, violence, and impunity you know, uh, against indigenous peoples. So that's the overarching concern that uh, IPRI is addressing. 
Uh, but in the process, uh, depending on the context we find ourselves in, uh, we also try to adapt to that situation. And all of us are now have now been, it's been a year since the pandemic has happened. And uh, the, the existence of this pandemic had really uh, adverse impacts on indigenous peoples, but it also has mobilized indigenous peoples to do what they can to be able to access the right to life, the right to health, as, as well as the right to their to defend their territories, lands, and resources. No, and so uh, we thought that this. Uh, period, we will gather more information around uh, what has been happening to indigenous people amidst COVID. Has it uh, lessened the uh, criminalization and violence against them, or has this worsened? So it's good to see that because we'll, uh, during the session of the permanent forum, we hope to be able to present uh, the the results of this as well as come up with some recommendations that can be adapted by the permanent forum final report. No, this is what indigenous peoples are always looking up to, that the, the information that the situation that they have shared will be reflected among the various recommendations that the permanent forum will have, which will be addressing states, UN agencies, multilateral bodies, as well as, of course, uh, the society in general, but also indigenous peoples themselves. Uh, and uh, for, for this to, to that's why we, wa we always wanted to have a session, no? We, this is the first time that IPRI is going to participate uh, in a session, in the events of the permanent forum session, and hopefully this will become Uh, regular planted. So for this evening, uh, I'm not going to introduce everybody. I would just like first to, to introduce Joanne, no, because she, she will be the one who will introduce the report, give a general overview. So uh, Joanne, as mentioned by Alan Kai, was with me when we uh, decided to establish IPRI because of the situation that we have seen no, all over the world, especially during my period, my uh, time as a UN Special Rapporteur, I've witnessed a lot of this kind of violence and criminalization happening to indigenous people. Peoples. And as we speak, things are happening when we had the side event also of IPRI a few days last, uh, last week. That was the day, exactly the same day that this Sandra uh, Peña was killed in Colombia. No? So it's a very real situation that we feel every day, that we hear of every day. And the really we are compelled to put uh, an institution that will focus its effort just on uh, making these issues visible and getting the actors, the actors that are causing this, as well as the actors who are victimized, to really de deal with the issue of criminalization and violence. No? And uh, so, uh, so that's what the reason why Joanne and I decided that this is an important uh, uh, mechanism that can deal with that. And of course, we know that uh, the theme that the Permanent Forum is dealing with now is a strong institutions, justice and peace. No, that's goal number 16 of the SDGs. So we would like also to link that with this particular theme that the Permanent Forum is holding. So Joanne is uh, the same as me, we belong to the same Kankanaoy Igorot peoples. And she has been, uh, for a long time, she has been the Secretary General of the Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact. And, and she also was a member of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Uh, presently, aside from doing this work in IPRI, she is convening the Indigenous Peoples Major Group you know, at the UN for the SDGs, for the high level panel on forum on SDGs. So uh, I give the floor to you, Joanne, and uh, uh, you will take over when I slowly disappear from the, from the scene. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vicky, and uh, good day to everyone, wherever you, you are. And thanks for uh, joining us in this launching of our report. Uh, but uh, maybe I can I request my colleague to, uh, that I share screen. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. Sorry, sorry. It's 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 not set up. It seems, but can I, I can I request my colleague to to share the 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 brief presentation then? 
So uh, while my colleague is sharing the, can you share? Can you share? Okay, there, uh, at the beginning. Yeah, so just, just as, uh, to take off from what Vicky has mentioned, one of the main, uh, uh, one of the aim of, of IPRI is to come out with a, uh, an annual report on the state of criminalization and impunity against indigenous peoples to, to keep this issue uh, visible at the, at the global level. And uh, hopefully uh, that this visibility and, uh, and awareness of what's happening with indigenous peoples uh, on criminalization uh, and the violation of, of indigenous people's rights with, with impunity will somehow lead to the needed action uh, to prevent and, and, and for indigenous peoples to have their rights uh, protected. So for this year, we have um, uh, the theme of the report is around defending our lands, territories, and resources amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, of course, this is uh, because of the situation uh, we, we were in last year. So this is a, a report for uh, the, 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 the state yeah, of criminalization uh, last year. Next. So uh, 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 I've already mentioned some of the, the background in relation to why IPRI is taking on this, uh, this uh, rep or coming out with this report. But just to, uh, just to acknowledge at the outset that we, 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 will, we will not claim that we our data or our report is complete because that's just not possible. So what, what, what we are, what is included in our report is mostly the documented uh, cases and, and reported uh, cases that we receive both from indigenous organizations and, and other uh, networks that are also uh, doing documentation or monitoring uh, these kind of, of, of cases. So our data, uh, the, the data that we, I will be presenting is not exclusively generated by, by IPRI, but also data that has been uh, credible data from other sources, including from international human rights organizations like uh, uh, Global Witness, Frontline Defenders, and Amnesty International, to name a few uh, who are uh, gathering uh, related uh, data. Uh, next. Next, next, please. So now uh, I, I will quickly just go through the global overview and key findings. Uh, by the way, the, the report is, is uh, now posted on the website, of, but I would like you to listen first to this overview and then get the full report. So this is more or less just to, to present the, the, the key findings. So next. Okay, now uh, if, if we look at what happened last year, uh, criminalization has in fact intensified during the pandemic. And this, uh, this was clearly demonstrated with the adoption and enforcement of policies and restrictions you know, in the guise of controlling the, the, the pandemic. We've seen, uh, we know that a number of states have, have, uh, have uh, restricted, for example, fundamental rights and freedoms and run after land rights defenders in the guise of controlling the, the pandemic. Uh, environmental safeguards uh, has already been weakened in, we can mention India, Brazil, even Canada, Indonesia, to, to cite a few countries who have weakened their uh, their environmental safeguards to fast track investments in the name of economic recovery from from COVID, which already started uh, last last year. Uh, so so this is also used to attract in investment. No, so uh, by weakening safeguards, they believe that uh, it would be easier for them to attract um, uh, uh, corporations and invest investments to undertake what they consider as uh, economic growth uh, plans uh, to recover from the pandemic. Next. Next. Who's operating? Can I? Okay. Now, uh, while uh, the on while one side is pursuing economic uh, growth uh, that is extractive in nature, the other side is also in reinforcing uh, fortress conservation 
where uh, uh, indigenous peoples in, in so-called con conservation areas like national parks are being evicted. And we've seen, for example, later in, in the report, we've seen the cases that, that has happened in, in India, but it's also happening in different parts of, of, uh, of Africa. Uh, and the complicating element, for example, in the case of, of Africa, but also to some extent in India, is also the participation of, of of armed groups, no, uh, not, not necessarily in the name of, of, of national conservation, but in areas where indigenous peoples are there uh, in, in, in this kind of situation and are being forced uh, out or evicted by, uh, or threatened by, uh, by also armed, armed groups. Um, the other, the other uh, thing that has been observed also uh, is the, the continuous operation and activities of uh, corporations, uh, especially extractive industries. Uh, we thought all along that under COVID with all the lockdowns and restrictions, that there will also be limitations to economic activities, but apparently not. In, in fact, many companies, mining companies have taken advantage of, of the lockdowns to pursue the, their, their expansion and operation of their, of their mining activities. Uh, we see this uh, in, in the Philippines, in, in Russia, even in Canada, in, in Mexico and India. In India, the, this was even used again to, um, to take over a for a customary forest for coal, for coal mining. Uh, and of course, these are happening without the, the, uh, the free prior and informed consent of, of indigenous communities. So we anticipate that in the coming years, this will actually worsen again in, uh, again under economic re recovery. And there will be more violation of land rights. There will be more violation of free prior and informed consent if we do not raise attention to this and, 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 and uh, make corporations and state uh, more accountable and, and that they, they should respect the rights of indigenous peoples. Next. Now, uh, in terms of the patterns of killings and criminalization, uh, the, our own documentation, the IPRI's uh, own data gathering, uh, already revealed that in mid-2020, there, there were already 204 cases of violence no? uh, against indigenous peoples. And through the uh, through uh, the, uh, the other information and data that we have gathered, uh, there's actually uh, 333 killings of human rights uh, defenders in in 25 countries, with 69 percent uh, involving uh, work on on land rights, uh, and 26 percent is specifically on indigenous peoples and and uh, and all those in the yeah, so this data uh, is uh, from um, from frontline defenders, not the, this uh, this uh, 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 annual uh, re report on the, on the on the rate of, of killings overall. Next, next this slide. Yeah, now the worst countries in relation to killings of indigenous peoples is. Uh, uh, that has been documented is yes, in Brazil with 10, and this is increasing. In Colombia now, this has increased, as already uh, pointed out by my colleague earlier and also Vicky. Philippines with 14 cases, seven in Honduras, but we actually also have 14 in Mexico. Uh, and and, 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 and uh, this, many of these cases uh, are, are, are done with impunity. Uh, there's hardly any access to justice by the families of, of the victims. And um, the trend is this is going to, it will not stop. The, the numbers are going to, to continue to increase in, in these uh, countries as, as impunity is, is, is happening. Those that have committed these, uh, these uh, killings are, are, are running free. And, 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 and are not uh, held uh, accountable. And uh, just to mention here that this data, again, I, I mentioned earlier, is not even complete. Uh, no, we, these are the more, more just the reported and documented cases. And we know that this case, there's many other cases happening, especially in the remote areas that remain unreported or undocumented. 
Next. Next. Yeah, and, 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 and what is observable is that these killings are undertaken, I, that, that the prior to killings, these victims were already demonized, vilified, and threatened uh, by largely uh, uh, paramilitary forces or, or even the, 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 the police, the, the, the military themselves. And, and so uh, it's, it's not that, that they suddenly are killed, but they're actually uh, threatened they, uh, because these are, many of them are, are known as, as activists. They're really the ones defending most of this. Those that, are, that were killed are uh, in, in, engaged to, to, uh, to defending and, and protecting their, their land rights. Uh, and they are demonized and in, in vilified. And this is more to set the public opinion that these people are bad. Right. So if something happens to them, then, you know, the people, well, you know, uh, they're bad people. That, that's the aim of the of the demonization and and vilification by calling them the enemies of the state or enemies of the people. And then later they're found dead. Right. So it's 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 really a very uh, uh, well, I, I don't know how to describe it, but it's it's uh, certainly um, the, the kind of of. Uh, justification that is completely um, uh, against against uh, any uh, accountability or commitment to respecting uh, human rights. Uh, uh, also that the families and or communities of those attacked or harassed or vilified uh, are, are also attacked uh, or harassed or vilified, meaning that that uh, especially for indigenous peoples, these leaders they are leaders of communities. No, so so if they are weakened, it's the whole community that is weakened. It's the 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 the, uh, the self de the the self determination of communities to protect their rights and uh, protect their lands are completely undermined. If their leaders are, are are killed or threatened or or even tortured, so 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 if the if if the demonization is also within the communities, the the, the chilling effect is also felt by 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 everyone. So, and and this phenomenon of of that that we always emphasize that when we look at indigenous leaders, we are not we are not talking of just individuals we're talking of communities so whatever happens an indigenous leader has serious implications to their communities uh, and the exercise of their of of our collective rights okay now on the point of uh, of uh, indigenous women which by the way uh, it seems like there's a growing number now of 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 uh, women victims, and I think this is more because there are more uh, they are better reported. Uh, but but in any case, the the consistent dimension in relation to uh, the violation of of indigenous women is the use of 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 sexual harassment, abuse, and 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 threats to silence them and their families, and and to and to put them in an embarrassing uh, situation to ride on the prevailing discrimination of indigenous women. And, and what is coming out now clearly that, that we have monitored is the use of, of uh, social media, uh, the digital platform. Right, because of course, indigenous peoples are also using digital platform, but this is also used, especially also against indigenous pe peoples to vilify or to demonize or to 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 discredit uh, indigenous um, leaders, and also to put shame to in, in indigenous women. For example, uh, uh, you, there, there's all threats, direct threats are even uh, posted on like WhatsApp, but also. The case, for example, of somebody accused to, to being the, the mistress of an indigenous uh, leader. No, so these are the ways that 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 women uh, in the front line of, of land rights are also being attacked. Next. Uh, so now the other thing that is um, clearly coming out is the in entrenched uh, relationship between discrimination and the cycle of Im impunity. Uh, because of the systemic discrimination, uh, the, the, those that are committing the, the attacks and violence 
are are feeling so so uh, uh, so superior so in, in a way that that they will not be made accountable. No, that it's uh, that, that that kind of behavior is is uh, uh, accepted because this people because of the general attitude of 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 discrimination. So there is actually the the link between discrimination and and in in, in, in impunity. Uh, what what we're citing, for example, is that. Police don't normally pursue cases involving indigenous peoples because you know these are this the, uh, they they um, uh, they they will not be held accountable anyhow if if, if they don't do anything. Next. So um, there are also cases where, in spite of protection mechanisms for human rights defenders, this in the case for of Latin America, there is still lack of political will. Uh, for example, Colombia has set up a protection mechanism, but the killings are continuing, and and the killings, the recent one on a governor, she's an indigenous governor, she's elected. By the from an in, uh, an, an indigenous leadership, no. Go, uh, so it's the governance, it's the practice of self determination that was attacked. It's not just the individual, right? So and and there's again uh, the issue of uh, lack of access to justice. So so the these protection mechanisms, while they are very positive, they have to be made efficient. They they have to function in stopping uh, the, the the violations of rights and providing access to justice. Because otherwise, then they they, they, they don't uh, this they they should not be called protection mechanisms if it the, it cannot function as such. And, and finally, just to mention that the continuing narrative that indigenous peoples as are anti-development is actually used to justify criminalization and dispossession of indigenous peoples, lands, territories, and resources. And, and these are offered to business and investors. And why do we say that the narrative uh, of uh, that indigenous peoples are anti-development when, for example, indigenous peoples oppose mining operations in their territories. Uh, we are seen as preventing progress for other people in the country, that we're preventing national development, and we are selfish in that sense. So then they are giving justification that mining should happen because then it will provide employment, then it will provide income for the country, but for indigenous peoples, that is the destruction of our lands. That is uh, the destruction of our environment. But they can, and and but then we will be perceived as as being anti-development. And and this narrative continues to prevail, and and giving justification to the to uh, to criminalization of of indigenous peoples. Okay, next. Okay. Uh, now, uh, in the report, these are the uh, these are the focus countries. It provides context and cases studies. I will not go through this because the the next speakers are going to um, to be speaking on this and also further elaborating on on what I've I've mentioned as the trends and the findings of the of the report. But just to mention that these countries are the focus countries uh, where IPRI works uh, at the moment and have of established partners at the national level. Okay, so next. So just to go to the conclusion and recommendations, next. Uh, that, that yes, uh, I've mentioned that, that uh, many states have actually taken advantage of COVID-19 to justify criminalization and viol uh, violation of indigenous people's rights, uh, particularly to, uh, to the rights of indigenous peoples to lands, territories, and resources, and the right to self-determination. And that the underlying discrimination and inequalities compounded uh, with the impact of COVID-19 has further aggravated incidents of violence and, and criminalization of indigenous peoples. Next. Uh, and then uh, thereby in, in relation to recommendations, um, 
Uh, of, of course, uh, we need to re remind the states again of, of, of their uh, responsibilities, their, their commitments on, and obligations to respect and protect human rights, including the collective rights of indigenous peoples, and that uh, states, financial institutions, and, and businesses need to address the impacts of discrimination and impunity, particularly in relation to the rights of indigenous peoples to our lands, territories, and resources and to self-determination um, because these are the, are the key actors that are driving uh, the systemic violation of the rights of indigenous uh, peoples, uh, the, the collective rights of indigenous peoples. And finally, uh, the need to strengthen the solidarity and cooperation of indigenous peoples, advocates and other sectors to end criminalization of indigenous peoples and advance the full recognition of our rights. Uh, it's, 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 it's still largely in our own uh, collective action, in our own um, uh, uh, solidarity that 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 we need to strengthen so that we can push uh, governments and those uh, responsible for the violation to be to 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 be uh, accountable and that the necessary policies uh, and uh, should be put in place and that they should be enforced properly for the recognition and protection and finally the full exercise and enjoyment of our rights. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. Vicky. Anyway, I I I don't know where Vicky is, but uh, the the report. Uh, uh, we apologize that the report at the moment is not available in Spanish and uh, French and port. Portuguese that but they will be uh be translated soon what we have is the English uh version and and the full report can like I said can be downloaded in the um website of of IPRI uh now I don't know why Vicky is not uh here but uh, just so that we can save on time uh may I request um uh DL DL, our colleague from uh, from DRC, to kindly take the floor. DL. Oui, hello. Bonjour, tout le monde. Uh, hello, everybody. Go ahead, DL. Okay. Bonjour, Joanna. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, we hear you, DL. Mm, je suis Monsieur DL. Um, uh, Monsieur DL Montire uh, of Fidep Lawambuti, and I am the national coordinator, the national EPIC coordinator in Asia. I work in collaboration with our partner and for the uh, for the implementation of our activities in the DRC. I am delighted to participate in this event. I would like to uh, talk to uh, complete and start with all participants on the concept of criminalization of indigenous peoples in the TRC. And I would more like to talk about land rights uh, where the criminalization has increased in the Democratic Republic of Congo. During this year, we tried to share several information and we uh, were involved in uh, the process, in advocacy processes, in order to uh, try to address and to stop these practices. But practically, I don't know if uh, Ivan can share the screen so that participants can, uh, can see my screen, because I can't share it. Okay. 
Let's continue. De deuxième page. Second page. Second, second slide. Ok, ma, ma présentation va s'étaler autour. My presentation uh, will be on these uh, points that we'll talk about introduction, a uh, global overview of indigenous pygmy people in the DRC, a uh, current situation of human uh, IPs, uh, human rights, and land grabbing and exploitation of indigenous people's land. On uh, of lens grabbing of IEP's lens grabbing next. and indigenous peoples during the pandemic. The next slide. Okay. <laughs> In terms of introduction, I would like to say that the Democratic Republic of Congo has four. Uh, uh, major ethnic groups, and it has been demonstrated historically that uh, indigenous pygmy peoples are the first inhabitants of the DRC. And they, uh, they are victims, the, the victims of uh, domination, of land grabbing, uh, spoliation and so on and so forth. Or uh, there is a group of people uh, the DRC are found in 21 provinces and we share the same reality. So uh, out of 26 provinces, we are represented in 21st uh, uh, provinces. Let's go to the next slide. Next slide. Okay. Yeah. Nous habitons, nous avons la, les caractères d'habiter. Oui. On habite dans la forêt. Oui, oui, oui. La forêt pour nous, c'est notre... Oui, 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 oui. Forest for us is a livelihood so, uh, gar which guarantees, which ensures our system. And we have other livelihoods such as hunting, a collective picking, net flight. And as I was saying, we are, we are over 1 million people uh, in 20, uh, 21 uh, provinces in the DRC. Next, Next slide. Oui, oui, Coco. Oui, est-ce que vous, est vous, me, vous me suivez? Oui, c'est vraiment la connexion fait, fait défaut. Euh, connexion, okay. Internet connection issue. Oui, allô, allô, Coco. Allô, uh, Pierre. Oui, yes. La, la, oui. Est-ce que je peux rentrer yes. sur les questions liées aux accaparements et la... May I, may I go back to uh, it related to land grabbing? La base de I was saying that issues related uh, but about this issue, the DRC implemented a system to, uh, to register uh, affected areas. 
Hello, hello. Yes, um. Oui, allo, allo, Coco. Akilas. Vous ne m'écoutez pas? You're, you're coming, choppy, choppy. Uh, we cannot hear well. So okay, yeah. Uh, uh, so, hello. Hello. Yeah, D D L and, and Akilas. Vous ne m'écoutez you... pas? J'ai un petit souci de connexion. Oui. Uh, DL has an internet connection issue. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So, so that's really unfortunate. So, it, it, uh, hey. uh, while he's fixing it, we can now move to the next speaker, and hopefully, he can join us back with a clearer line. Right. So, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, and DL. For that presentation on the situation of, of land grabbing in in DRC, so because we don't have much time, uh, may, may can I, I hope we can now proceed to our uh, next uh, speaker from uh, Mexico. We have Ruben Moreno Fraiba. Is is Ruben here? Abel, is is Ruben here? Hello. If not, um, can I call then on? Uh, sí, sí. Bueno. Buenos días. Yes, I'm here. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Me presento. Soy Abel Barrera. My name is Abel Barrera, representative of IPRI in Mexico. First of all, I would like to present a general framework of the report. And after that, my colleague Ruben will resume sharing a concrete case on the situation of a Mexican state in the southern part of Mexico. The state is called Chiapas. So let me begin with my presentation. We're going to share this presentation with you. But first of all, I would like to send warm greetings to you all. And thank you for inviting us here today. So we would like to present to you part of the report we submitted to IPRI regarding the situation in Mexico. In this sense, we would like... Next, next slide, please. So to start, in Mexico, there are 126 million people among this population, 7,364,645 people belong to an indigenous people. We have recorded 68 indigenous peoples as a total in Mexico. And as you can see on the map, most of the indigenous people's population is concentrated in the central and southern area of our country in the Yucatan Peninsula. And as you can see, there is a lot of richness in our country. We also have some indigenous communities in the northern part of Mexico. Of course, all of these places represent sanctuaries when it comes to the natural richness we have and that has been preserved by indigenous peoples in several of these territories mining projects are being implemented and this has created a confrontation situation with indigenous peoples in mexico because there has been an organization of groups. Next slide, please. Here, I would like to highlight that in our country, Mexico, we have seen a violent crisis and insecurity, and it has reached alarming levels. There are a lot of murders, displacement, and forced disappearance of the general population. There are very severe situations in the northern part of the country, as well as the western part. And let's not forget 
all of the places where there is indigenous population, such as the state of Guerrero, Chiapas, and Oaxaca. Our biggest concern in the country is the link that we have seen between with the organized crime. And so this is a situation that is increasing. In fact, there are some regions where organized crime is seen as the real power, especially in indigenous regions. For example, we come from the state of Guerrero and we have seen how groups of organized crime are taking over the territory. And they are also opening businesses in order to control drug racking and other business businesses we have in that region. The situation is very dire, so much that the organized groups have negotiated with mining companies so that they can guarantee the security against the workers. And this happened precisely during the pandemic. There were mining companies that didn't stop their activities. They continued to work in spite knowing that they needed to first protect the health of their workers. There were some cases, for example, Equinox in Guerrero, Carrizalillo. This mining company that started their work, they didn't guarantee the protocol to identify and protect the workers from any infection. And in what, in fact, there were a lot of con a lot of infections and even deaths from the workers in the mining company. The gov the federal government declared the mining as an essential activity. So they were giving priority to the mining extraction activities instead of protecting the health of the workers specifically in places where they are facing a lot of infections because there are no health care services. Next slide, please. On this slide, I would like to highlight that the situation of indigenous peoples in Mexico is very important. And it's also very important to mention the violence that has risen up due to land disputes. As it was stated in the previous report by Victoria Tauli, These, these land disputes have caused conflicts between the different community, communities, and this is because there's no legal framework that guarantees yeah, um, the, uh, the recognized lands, the ancestral lands, and this is part of one of the biggest issues. There's also a struggle to defend the land and self-determination this is a key aspect for Mexico, and it has to do with the imposition of mega projects encouraged by previous administrations and the current administration as well. They always want to give space to these mega projects for development, and they see indigenous peoples as anti-developers as if they are against development. And there, although there have been consultations, they do not comply with all the protocols so that 
interpreter peoples could be able to participate freely and give their opinion on the mega projects. This is happening in Mexico with the Maya train, Tren Maya, where the train will go through several communities and indigen the indigenous peoples living there haven't been able to raise their voice. We also see that one of the most important and strongest conflicts faced by indigenous peoples is the organized crime. And when it comes to that, there's no way we can protect them. Many of them have even asked for the federal government to come here, to come to their communities, in this case, the National Guard, but they haven't had the attention. So there is a very big confrontation aspect and cases of forced displacement in several states where there's a lot of organized crime. Okay, Abel. Mm -hmm. Abel, uh, may I request you to kindly conclude? Okay. Yes, no problem. So we are lacking a legal framework that has to recognize fully the indigenous people's right. I will now give the floor to my colleague Ruben so that he can wrap up this presentation, sharing with you the case of the state of Chiapas. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ruben Moreno from San Bartolomé de las Casas in the state of Chiapas. In the same context, as Abel was just sharing with us, we have suffered a lot of criminalization against indigenous peoples, and I would like to share with you several situations that we have lived. Uh, uh, bueno? Yeah, uh, uh, Ruben, can you kindly bueno. summarize? Yeah, because we still have uh, quite a number of speakers. Eh, muy bien. Entonces, en nuestro estado de Chiapas. Yes, of course. So, in the state of Chiapas, for over three years in the Aldama municipality, we have been recording forced internal displacements. These displacements are mainly due to the armed groups that are firing against indigenous communities in Aldama. This has caused a full omission of the Mexican state. There are no research, no investigation. They are not bringing the perpetrators before justice and their no measures have been taken. No one knows who are those groups that are firing against indigenous communities. And this is a very big concern for us because when it comes to forced displacement, for us, it is, it's just as, is, as if they were torturing us because they are constantly firing on us and people have to flee. They have to run towards the, mo the, the mountains and seek shelter. Let's not even mention the lack of healthcare services and education. There's also a lot of discrimination and criminalization of indigenous peoples in the Chilon municipality, the landowners got together to protest against the construction of the National Guard. They are building in their territory without informing them. And they are building a headquarters for the National Guard. However, when they carry out their protests, they are criminalized and Jose Luis and Cesar, two indigenous colleagues, were detained and accused of a riot. And so, as you can see, there's a lot of criminalization against indigenous peoples. Everything is happening in full impunity. Yeah. And the Mexican state is not only letting 
law enforcement groups act, but also armed groups that are acting in complicity. Yeah. And the permit of the state. Yeah, okay, okay. Robin? Okay, uh, muchas gracias, uh, Robin and Abel. I think you for, um, really pointed out the, the serious uh, cases happening in, in Mexico on the issue of, of, of criminalization, which is really very alarming. Now we move on to the next uh, speaker. Uh, we have uh, Maita Kiban from the, the Philippines. She is the co-convenor of the Panakiusa, which is the national network of indigenous peoples in the Philippines. My You can take the floor now. I mean, who will... Thank you, John Pasanchan. I think I had a technical glitch and I couldn't quite get to my microphone to turn on and then my camera. So here we are. So I will try my best not to belabor the framework because I think uh, John did a wonderful job to to uh, earlier. So this is just straightforward reporting, a lot of visuals. I hope to keep everyone awake. Good evening. Uh, from the Philippines. Uh, oh, let me see. There you go. So just, I said I won't belabor, but allow me just a bit of a context. So in the Philippine context, it's really worsening as in elsewhere of the human rights violations. For the Philippines in particular, perhaps quite similar to Mexico, um, this war framing of, of many things by the administration it started off with the Duterte administration's war on drugs and now it's war on terrorists. So it's really war mongering, the war framing of, of, of many things. No? So um, this criminalization found some teeth with uh, a weaponizing of the law. We have uh, recently passed uh, the Anti-Terror Act of 2020, of which has one of the highest record petitions filed against its constitutionality in the court. Uh, with one or two petitions, the ones that we support are primarily of uh, indigenous peoples and support groups uh, assailing the constitutionality of uh, the Anti-Terror Act. Uh, I think their filing, their being petitioners of the Anti-Terror Act also had some repercussions in the liberties of some of our petitioners. So another phenomenon that um, is quite prevalent in the Philippines is uh, red tagging. This whole anti-communist, uh, uh, what do you call this program of, of, of this administration, well, of previous administration, but more so in, in this administration in terms of funding uh, anti-insurgency projects is what we call red tagging, red being the communist colors. No? And, and this has been um, greatly tied with what John has earlier mentioned uh, with a build, build, build project of, of the government, which is it's very uh, it's a very, very developmentalist kind of, of, of looking at infrastructure. No? This almost futuristic um, illustration I have here is one of the Clark Economic Zone, which is uh, an ancestral, partly sitting on ancestral domain of Aitas in Luzon. And one thing more about um, this build, build, build developmentalist framing is that it is also framed by the government as a source of recovery, not only economic, but also uh, recovery from the pandemic. So some of the examples would be um, in watershed areas, but are also in ancestral domains, and which also conflates with economic as well as trade relations. This one is Kaliwa Dam. This is by the Remontados, uh, the indigenous peoples, uh, Dumagat Remontados, and this is under the BRI, the Belt Road Initiative. And in particular, I think this is with the AIAB Bank. No? Um, some of the things that we are looking to also with this um, developmentalist mode is the opening of mining. And, and here I feature some one of the community partners we have, which is the Balaan community in, in South Cotabato in Mindanao. There is the threat of uh, SMI mining, which is thought to be the biggest copper and gold in Southeast Asia, if not in Asia, that will soon open. So very recently, a few days before we celebrated uh, Earth Day, 
uh, Duterte lifted a ban that put a moratorium to uh, issuance of mining agreements. So pretty much opening um, mining in the Philippines, uh, reneging on his promise some, some years ago when he would go on his uh, State of the Nation address to say that the environment was non-negotiable, short of threatening uh, the mining industry from closing down. And here we are, a lifting of the moratorium. Um, I think John has, has pointed this out that um, within lockdown, it's really the mining industry, a lot of the extractive industry that is posting a lot of profits no? in the Philippines, especially for 2021, for example, Nickel Asia, uh, posted 52% increase in its uh, in its profit. That's uh, around four billion pesos. No. So what are what are the impacts of this at the community level? With the anti-terror law, in fact, the first claim, the first victims were um, indigenous peoples in, in Zambales. Uh, there were around five of them arrested. And uh, some of the cases that were filed against them, and you will hear this over and over in the case of the Philippines, is illegal possession of firearms. There would be bazookas, sometimes grenades, and what have you, high-powered rifle, uh, found in the homes of, 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 of um, Nipa huts, you know. Uh, coconut shelters of, of indigenous communities by possessing high-powered weapons. So in the case of, of uh, the Aitas and Zabales, two of them were actually um, proceeded against the anti-terror. They are still uh, incarcerated right now. What is quite disturbing about this case is we had a progressive group that was actually taking care of their case, the National Union of Philippine uh, Lawyers. And then uh, very systematically, what the uh, National Commission on Indigenous Peoples, a, a government agency, um, sort of undermined the efforts of these lawyers and took, um, took, uh, took hold of the case um, instead. So we're very worried that the handling of the case will not be to the best interests of, of the communities. No? We see here a photograph of Wendell Bulingit. Wendell is the chairperson of the CPA and also one of our petitioners in the anti-terror uh, petition. Um, of how the police would be posting wanted ads. This would be a sample of a red tag. Um, this one simply captures a criminal offense, that of murder. But at the community levels, you will have a lot of, um, what do you call this, posters claiming Wendell to be uh, a member of the, com uh, the Communist Party, so on and so forth. Um, Wendell, uh, in Wendell's case, the reinvestigation was granted by the court. And the arrest warrant was uh, thankfully withdrawn, but he's still not off the hook. So right now, Wendell is, is under sanctuary and is keeping low. Uh, had this case not progressed against him, he would be the one speaking before you instead of myself, actually. Here we have a case of a peaceful barricade of community members uh, barricading the coming in of um, Thanks by Oceana Gold, an Australian and uh, uh, Swiss mining corporation in the north of Luzon. And you had around 30, 40 people peacefully barricading, and you had about uh, over 100 police force coming in to, to, um, to subdue them. Their leader was actually taken in, in court. And um, the case that was filed against them was this um, very vague uh, uh, seldom used, not even uh, not, uh, epidemic law because he was supposed to have breached quarantine, uh, quarantine procedures, but not the present quarantine procedures of that. So um, he's out on bail, but his charges are still not, has not yet been charged. Uh, I think many of you have heard of the Tumandok case. This is the case of a uh, nine red tagged indigenous peoples killed. 17 others nabbed. This was a joint operation with the Philippine Army and the Philippine police. Um, they were protesting the construction of a dam project in, in their locality. This is um, financed by the Korean back. Um, nine people remain in jail, four are out on bail, three were forced to flee, uh, I mean, uh, to plea bargain. Uh, that's the status. 
here we have a case of uh, Betty Belen, and uh, I take her to uh, be um, the leader as well as a visual representation because uh, Betty's community was protesting against the Chevron, uh, Aragorn Chevron geothermal plant that's supposed to be, uh, that's already under uh, ongoing exploration now in the province of Kalinga. No? Uh, very similar to other indigenous people, she was also charged with illegal possession of firearms. No, uh, these charges were uh, dismissed, but uh, similarly with Wendell, Betty is also under sanctuary right now. And very recent as well, uh, you had the arrest of uh, the twenty-six Bakwit schools. Uh, members. These were made up of uh, seven adults. The rest were uh, uh, minors, students. The Bakwits, the Bakwit is actually um, how evolved from the term evacuees, no? because many of the students evacuated for northern Mindanao, where they had to evacuate from their ancestral domains when it was heavily militarized and it was heavily bombed. So many of the schools, what we call Lumad schools, have actually closed down. And here, a religious order in Cebu, in the Visayas, um, became their sanctuary and where they continued their, their education um, with the use of the, with the facility. We thought that uh, being under the refuge, cover, and protection of the fathers in Cebu, they would be protected. But as you can see from these photographs, uh, the police came in and rescued them. Uh, the accusation was that the Lumad school is supposed to be a haven for, for, communist, for communist teaching. Yeah. And so there. Last slide, okay. Joanne. Yes. OK, OK. Uh, <laughs> this one conflates uh, a bit of an issue now because this is evacuation. While we cannot actually pinpoint to criminal cases filed against them, but uh, this is a community of the Doray Lambangian that is caught in the crossfires between the government forces and uh, the Moro, uh, rather militant uh, liberation. And since last year now, there are almost 5,000 the Doray Lambangian, um, what they call this, in, in, in evacuation. And um, a lot of things that are happening, their houses are being burned, their animals are being stolen, and this does not uh, receive, this does not receive uh, media support. And we'd really like for this to be um, brought up to, to greater awareness. And I know I said last slide, but let me, um, how do you say this? Because I desperately want to end on a positive note. So how red tagging has gotten bad in the Philippines is that you had, Community pantries are uh, initially started by very young people. You put in what you can give, you take what you need, you know. And what happened was some of these pantries had to close down because they were threatened by the police for being uh, communist activities. But what was good was that instead of the communities being curtailed, you had 350 all over the Philippines mushrooming, no? community pantries. So there is also this, this, this growing exhaustion, this growing anger, this growing finding our own ways to, to, to act against the impunity of this government. So I hope that's a tad bit positive enough. Yes. So thank you for your patience. I bring you back to John. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, Maya. Indeed, that's a very positive note. That it's it's actually the people trying coming together to find solutions uh, to this kind of of problem, uh, addressing particularly the 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 COVID. And uh, it's it's really the community spirit that we can change that situation instead of more repression coming from from the state. So thank you for that, my. I'm checking if if Pavel if Pavel is not here, may I call then on on uh, our colleague uh, uh, from IPRI, he's part of our board, uh, Lars Anders Baer, to read the solidarity message for the indigenous peoples in Myanmar. Lars? Yes. Lars, Do can you, you unmute? Yes. Okay, so a moment now. Yes, uh, friends of the indigenous peoples, ladies and gentlemen. In this context, the communization of, 
violence and impunity against indigenous peoples is difficult to avoid to talk about the recent developments in, in Myanmar and the result of the coup d'etat conducted by the military in the country. On February the 1st uh, this year, the Burmese, Burmese military staged a coup d'etat and arrested the government, including the state councillor San Suu Kyi, and imposed a year-long national uh, state of emergency uh, all through powers alleged under the, the constitutions from 2008. In the months uh, since the coup, mass protests have been taking place across the country, opposing the, the military move. Some of the protests have turned deadly. On March 27, uh, it's the deadliest so far, and it was almost uh, 100 people killed during that day. The media reports reveal that close to 1,000 people have been detained, including high-profile leaders and civilian government. Uh, this followed the same in human, in human logic that resulted in, in thousands of killing Royangas and more than 700,000 700, fled to Bangladesh following an army crackdown in 2017. Uh, uh, Myanmar is one of the most ethnic diverse countries in the Southeast Asia with 135 different ethnic groups. Indigenous peoples are recognized as, quote, ethnic nationalities, end of quotes, as a result of the government's uh, willful ignorance of the internationally recognized concepts of indigenous peoples, there is no accurate information about the number of indigenous people in the country. The government claims that uh, citizens of uh, the, um, Myanmar are indigenous, but and and on the basis dismissed the uh, uh, applicability of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to Myanmar. However, uh, the country voted in favor of the UNRIP adopted by the General Assembly 2007. Um, before 1948, when uh, the country achieved independence from British, uh, indigenous people had self-determination region in the federal states and also in the respective territories which they occupied for more than, uh, more than a century. But the civil war in the in the country started just a month after the country independence from Britain in 1948. Late in 1962, the military took power and ruled the country for over 70 years, and it seems to continue. During the decade, dozens of ethnic groups have taken up arm, arms against the central governments and the army. The ethnic insurance have been responded to with brutal repression by the military. Indigenous peoples, mostly in the remote areas, have experienced living under military regime for decade, decades in the past, and they understand what a military coup means. Uh, as a result of the coup d'etat, numerous countries have uh, condemned the military takeover and the subsequent crackdown. The US, UK, European Union have all responded with the sanction of the military officials. China has for, for, has for, for so far blocked the UN Security Council statement condemning the coup, but has backed calls for re the release of Ms. Suzuki and the return of the democratic norms, but has previously opposed international interventions in, in the country. The US, UK and European Union have, have all responded with sanction on the military officials. Uh, the South Asian states, countries have been pushing diplomatic efforts uh, to end the crisis. Southeast Asian leaders have just urged the head of the, the, the army, the, the uh, Mayan army, which took power in, in the coup in February to end the violence crackdown in the country. A statement uh, after a summit last week said, said the leaders and the foreign ministers from 10 member countries in the Association of Southeast Asian Nations has reached a consensus on five points. points. They, in, in, they include asking for an immediately stop of the violence and opening of a dialogue between the military and the civilian leaders with the, with the process to oversee, uh, with 
with that uh, the process is overseen by a special Asian envoy who, who could also visit the, the country. The group also offered a humanitarian assistance. The Asian leaders have been widely criticized for inviting the, the, to, the, the, to their meeting the general in charge of the coup uh, and the responsible for overthrowing the elected government in the country and for the unleashing savage violence on those opposing uh, opposed uh, to this coup. Sorry to say, uh, many of these countries are practicing the same policy, the policy towards indigenous peoples and often using military personnel to control the indigenous territories. The, the situation in the Chittagong Hill tracks is, is an example of, of, of this practice. And this is uh, done by the by by the by the uh, by government of Bangladesh, and uh, the whole area is administrated by the Bangladesh military. In this context, it is more or less impossible to avoid, avoid the role of China. The government has the government of China have a special responsibility because uh, the Myanmar is so to speak, quote, uh, uh, backyard end of quote of China. And the fact that China is, uh, is a member of the, of the UN Security Council. In closing, we need to step up the pressure against the military dictatorship in Myanmar. UN and other relevant bodies must, including the UN United Nations Permanent Forum on this issue, must only continue in con condemning the, the, and taking action against the coup and the gross violation of human rights, including killing children by uh, military personnel. The global indigenous community and the, and the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues must mobilize and take necessary steps both to support indigenous peoples and the re-establishment of the democratic institution in, in IMR. Um, and by all means uh, undermine the credibility and the existence of the military dictatorship in Myanmar. That was the end. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Lars, for yeah, raising the uh, attention again, the global. We need really global solidarity and attention to what is happening in, in Myanmar. And hopefully the global community will, will, will um, respond to the demands and calls of the, the peoples in, in Myanmar, including the at least 30% uh, indigenous peoples calling for a restoration of democracy and, and peace and, and, and justice. So thank you for that, uh, Lars. Now we, I want to call on our uh, pa panel of reactors. I, um, th these are actually from the, the partners and, and members or advisory group members of, of IPRI. Uh, I would like to call first on uh, Michael Taylor, the executive director of ILC or the International Land Coalition to, to speak as he needs to leave in a few minutes. So Michael. Mike? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, John, and uh, hello to everybody. So on behalf of the International Land Coalition, uh, our 250 members, a good proportion of whom uh, belong to indigenous peoples, uh, firstly, thank you uh, and a big age. congratulations to IPRI for uh, the work you've done on this report. Uh, it is so important to make visible what is invisible uh, in terms of the harassment and the killings of uh, land and environmental defenders. Uh, and we know, as you pointed out at the beginning, Joanne, that um, to be a land defender is, is one of the most dangerous kinds of human rights uh, defenders. And to be an indigenous land defender is, is even more risky. Uh, these are the highest categories of, of uh, human rights defenders who are, uh, who are targeted. So this is really a, um, a task we have of making these abuses known uh, and visible, which is the first step uh, for uh, addressing them. We know in ILC, we, uh, unfortunately, we share your, uh, your pessimism, Joanne, that as, we, as the world tries to emerge from um, COVID, the COVID pandemic, uh, that there will be even more pressures on the lands uh, and territories of indigenous peoples as governments see those resources as opportunities to kickstart their economies. So as we look ahead, there's all the more reason for us to be uh, working together 
uh, to resist this. Uh, and as ILC, we fully commit ourselves to working together with Indigenous Peoples' Organizations in solidarity with you uh, and in support with you. Three things in particular we'll be doing. Uh, we're helping uh, to monitor. We're working with um, many other organizations uh, to monitor um, abuses against land and environmental defenders, including Indigenous Peoples. Firstly, secondly, uh, we have programs in each region uh, together with the Defender the Defender this coalition and um, other members of ILC uh, as an emergency fund to protect defenders who, uh, who are in trouble. Uh, and thirdly, and the most important long-term one is working to secure the recognition of the rights of indigenous peoples. Um, this is not something we'll do overnight, but it's something we have to do. Uh, and I think as we, as we look, if there's anything we can learn from this pandemic, the world uh, is realizing that the system is broken and our biggest worry is that the old system is put back again in place. So as IOC right now, as we're on the eve of our next strategy, which will take us to 2030, our collective effort will be to support um, putting in place a different system in terms of the recognition of indigenous people's rights to land, territory and natural resources, the recognition of the land rights of local communities, one in which people uh, are at the center, what our members call people-centered land governance. And I think the only way that we'll achieve trying to shift the system, trying to shift power, uh, is doing it together um, and respecting the role that, that you as organizations belonging to indigenous peoples have at the center of that process and us behind you and us beside you. Uh, so we're committed to that process. Congratulations again, and, and um, we're with you. Thank you. Thank, thank, uh, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Michael. And we also look forward to strengthening further our collective action in defense of uh, uh, land rights. So, yes, we should work together uh, strongly this time. Thank you again, uh, Michael, for, for that uh, expression of support and, and solidarity. Now I want to uh, call on uh, Dr. Bernadette Carls. She is with the... Um, the, uh, the BMZ of the government of, of Germany. So, and, and she's part also of the advisory group of uh, IPRI. So Bernadette, you have the floor. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Joanne, dear Francisco, dear attendees, participants, and report presenters. Thank you very much, Joanne, for this special invitation and opportunity to comment IPRI's annual report with its special focus that you mentioned on the situation in Congo, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, India, and the Philippines. I understand and I have seen now that we sadly continue to live in this global crisis of attack against indigenous people, Vicky mentioned already some years ago before the pandemic. And before I comment shortly on the report, I would like to express my deepest respect for your work and for your constant efforts, your courage and your perseverance to collect data, information and document the ongoing discrimination and criminalization of indigenous peoples all over the world. I think it's hard for us to imagine what this means uh, for your personal life, for your families and for your daily risks. So thank you very much. The situation has aggravated with COVID-19 in the last year with a lack and misuse of rules and laws in different environmental contexts. You mentioned that. And I think with, with your presentation and with the presentation of the um, report presenters, and we got an idea what it means to constantly fight for your human rights. But I think it's essential for the survival of indigenous people all over the world that this work and networking continues and is made visible. I thank you and IPRI for raising awareness, you mentioned it, raising awareness and raising attention for the issue of criminalization and impunity of indigenous human rights defenders in different contexts of land defense, mining, renewable energy, agribusiness, extractive business and national mega projects I will mention it as the Tren Maya. Indigenous peoples have been particularly affected as a collective by the pandemic and especially women, you mentioned it. Indigenous human rights defenders remain among those most affected by attacks, COVID-19 prevention and so-called 
response measures by states have made it even more difficult and extremely challenging for you, for indigenous peoples, to monitor, to report human rights violations, to protest against these violations and hold perpetrators responsible and just to survive. And impunity during the COVID-19 crisis encourages um, differently, different private and state actors and companies to pursue their attacks to indigen um, in, against indigenous people. In these difficult times, you and EPRI have done, I think, an extraordinary job to set up mostly remote, I think, an indigenous-led organization, the first <laughs> international global organization. EPRI has successfully built up a global network of indigenous peoples and their organizations and has managed to combine national, uh, regional and global advocacy. And I think this is really very important and it's a big work because I, I lived some years, I lived and worked several years in Mexico and I had the opportunity to work with indigenous people in Chihuahua, with Raramui people and also in Oaxaca and Chiapas. And what I observed was that there is so much diversity. There's not the indigenous people. <laughs> so to have a communication and to build up a global network uh, is really something very important, strong. And uh, yeah, thank you for that. As a representative of German Development Corporation, I would like to express my deep concern for the extremely worrying situation of continued and increased criminalization on a global scale. Your report sheds light on the global patterns on a system of intended inequality, deprioritizing indigenous people against business and money for a few, the lack of responsibility taken by different state actors, and the perfidious strategy of criminalization of discrediting and intimidating human rights defenders, which lead, you have described it in its worst cases, to displacement, torture, and assassination. Besides the global analysis, EPRI's report and monitoring is an important contribution to highlight particularities in specific countries where the situation is escalating. And reading these individual stories of criminalized human rights defenders in the different country studies causes me, I have to say, uh, goosebumps and disgust. I feel ashamed and I feel anger to see these mm. shrinking spaces increase. Yeah. Um, Thanks so for visualizing the human stories and tragedies behind all these numbers you mentioned and that we can see in the media if we can see them. <laughs> German Development Corporation will continue to support EPRI in this important work and we will share this report. We already shared it with, its, with uh, our partners and in our political dialogues because what you also mentioned and many of you mentioned solidarity is more important than ever. I would like to close my statement with good but modest news. <laughs> Germany recently, 10 days ago, yes. uh, ratified uh, ILO Convention 169. <laughs> it passed our parliament. Um, this is good news. It's a, a, a little, yeah, a yeah, little step. The respect for indigenous rights, the right to self-determination, and what you also mentioned, free prior informed consent remains a concern for German Development Corporation. And with the ratification of ILO 169, Germany stressed the importance of a binding convention on indigenous people's rights. So, yeah, I think we live in a mad world um, where the aggressors can accuse human rights defenders and indigenous peoples for, uh, for committing crimes that they haven't done. So I think we have to change this together and raise attention and demand for accountability. Thank you very much, Joan. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks a lot, Bernadette, and thank you for the good news. It's really indeed, I mean, it's a light <laughs> for us. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's really important that, that uh, I mean, it, it really adds a milestone uh, for the recognition and protection of indigenous people's rights that benefits humanity. And, and it's, it's even more admirable that it's coming from a country without indigenous peoples, but are committing to respect uh, indigenous people's rights. So it, it really sends a very positive signal globally. And with this, we, we definitely look forward to a strengthened 
partnership uh, with the German government in this common agenda to uh, pr promote uh, human rights, indigenous people's rights. And like, like you said, that the political dialogue, we have to keep the political dialogue going because that's the, that's the way we can also find solutions. So thank you for, uh, for putting that uh, also, uh, Bernadette. Now, I would like to call on, on Patrick uh, Ali. Uh, he's the executive director of uh, Global Witness, who has also been, uh, who has actually supported us in, in, in this work. Um, Patrick? Thank you, Joan. Um, and thank you, everybody else, uh, all of the contributors. Um, I, I, well, I'm genuinely reacting. I haven't prepared anything. I, you know, it's... All of the themes that we've heard about are depressingly familiar. Um, the issues of impunity, criminalization, et cetera. And as, as I think everyone said, the situation is getting worse. Um, but I think that we, we shouldn't lose hope. Uh, I think that the, the formation of IPRI is critical. I think that bringing maximum awareness globally to this issue is one of the key uh, solutions we're going to find here. Um, I particularly value the work of IPRI because it's, um, you know, its board is entirely made up of indigenous peoples, which makes it, I think, I wouldn't swear to it, unique, which is great. Um, and I also want to thank them for the privilege of serving on the International Advisory, Advisory Group. It's, um, it's a great honour for me to do so. I just wanted to, to sort of come up with a sort of pulling on a couple of the themes that people have talked about where I, I think that there should be a real focus. Other people may have different views. Again and again, we hear of the, the flawed development model, um, extractive projects, agro-business, usually get their social license to operate by saying they're bringing wealth and development to the countries concerned or to the people concerned. Um, and I think we need, you know, led by our Indigenous colleagues to to really tackle that, because if it's coming from the people on the ground, that message who are being affected, then, you know, those of us who are working internationally have a much better chance of serving them to try and, and get those things, um, uh, you know, seen in the, the light they should be seen in, that they generally serve corporations as opposed to the people concerned. Um, the issues of uh, impunity, of course, is the one that rides through this um, it's hard to get countries like Brazil, for example, at the moment, or Myanmar, you know, as, as was recently just described, to, to tackle the issue of impunity within countries. But internationally, we still can bring pressure to bear. There's a growing momentum for um, the International Criminal Court to get involved in environmental issues. They can do so under their 2016 policy. Um, and of course, there's a movement for this crime of ecocide, where, you know, the combination of those things, I think, with evidence from the ground, uh, we can start bringing in the real deterrent effect um, that, uh, you know, being indicted by the International Criminal Court could bring. Um, and finally, just uh, I've said this at IPRI gatherings before, um, I think we can try and tackle companies' social license to operate. Um, but more tangibly, we have in the EU now this law coming in on mandatory due diligence, which applies to goods and finance of projects that are destroying uh, the environment, that are causing social harms. Um, and together, I think we can try and make that law as strong as we possibly can. And I think, and one just off the top of my head, is that any extractive practice now that's affecting indigenous people that is fossil fuel based given the year that we have with the cop so if it's coal mines if it's oil um then i think we have a real really good chance of destroying the social license of companies to operate i'll, I'll finish on that point and just to again thank everyone um for, for this fascinating uh, webinar yeah uh thanks Thanks, uh, Patrick. That has been very useful uh, as, as we move forward no, to addressing the, the issue of in, impunity and, and criminalization. I think the, the point that you made that we need to use uh, regional and global mechanisms uh, to counter impunity is, is really important and, and that, that we need to build the evidence to point out state accountability. And also the work with the, with the private sector, particularly on, on business and human rights, the, uh, 
as as you mentioned, the social license to operate uh, by companies, but also the, the uh, in, investors, not their their partners have have, have to really be one um, one clear uh, target and uh, of, of sustained efforts uh, by different organizations. And in 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 and uh, this uh, the work with the, the the EU that we 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 did with you has really uh, gone a long way in, in terms of also raising awareness on the need for that that indigenous peoples should also know that we can push uh, as, uh, companies to abide by that to respect human rights that they, they you, you know if they are powerful they also have obligations to do so so I think this is is certainly a priority uh, for for IPRI and 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 I will look forward to further collaboration with with, with you on 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 this uh, on this point uh, on, on uh, including the work on fossil fuel or the the extractive uh, industry to make that that shift. Uh, so thank you, thank you, uh, Patrick, for adding these elements. Now uh, I would like to now have uh, Carol Excel from uh, WRI or the World Resource Institute, and and Carol is also part of our uh, advisory group, and she's also with the Defend the Defenders uh, Network. Carol. Thank you very much, uh, Joan, and thank you uh, to hosting this webinar um, by, by IPRI. Um, it's really my privilege, privilege and pleasure to be here. Um, I want to also join um, in congratulating IPRI for their work in highlighting criminalization of indigenous peoples around the globe and really recognizing the stories of injustice um, that they outline and including the impunity that considers, especially in the case study countries that were mentioned. Um, this report really reinforces to me the work that we are doing jointly with IPRI and many others, including ILC frontline defenders, global witness, business and human rights defenders, on building a global database of threats, attacks and killings of land and environmental defenders. Um, we are doing this because we recognize that governments are often failing to document systematically threats, attacks um, against uh, human rights defenders, indigenous and land and environmental defenders. And we know that where go governments fail to document, they also fail to act. So this report is really unique uh, and important. Um, and I want to stress in particular um, the importance of highlighting criminalization and its meaning and impact on indigenous peoples and communities around the globe. Uh, there is not, if you look even, do a basic Google search, many reports that go into depth on the issue of criminalization of indigenous, indigenous peoples. And um, perhaps the only country that is doing in-depth work on this is Australia, but around the world, there just is not enough uh, reporting on this. And so this report, I think, holds a very unique place um, in trying to bring this to global attention. Um, criminalization, as defined in the report, is really the misuse of criminal laws that involves the manipulation of punitive power of the state and non-state actors in order to control, punish, or prevent the exercise of the right to defend human rights. And it is really critical that we understand this term, and IPRI's report is one of the few that is out there that delves into what this means. And we need to continue to refine this term around the globe in countries in which uh, indigenous peoples are being criminalized. Um, if we understand this term, we can start understanding where state institutions are using different powers to normalize violence against indigenous peoples. And we can start looking at aspects of reform. So I wanna highlight the importance of this report in that respect. Secondly, I think the IPRI report, through harnessing case studies, has demonstrated how the acts of government, police, business, individuals, and large-scale criminal groups and the courts have per perpetuated the criminalization of indigenous peoples. And so any recommendations that come out of the report will have to address those multiple actors. It's not one actor alone, it's many in many of the countries that are outlined. Um, and we need to understand the impact that these different groups have had on indigenous people um, through use of violence, smear attacks, online and in person, hate speech, red tagging, illegal arrests, displacement, enforced disappearances. Um, and so this report is one attempt to give us a baseline which allows us to then look for reforms. And lastly, I want to state 
that it, the report also highlights to me the importance of the need to improve access to justice in the courts for land rights, environmental conflicts, and human rights abuses. Uh, without legal reforms to the justice system, we will continue to see the, the current status of impunity fostered in many countries around the globe. And so I also want to mention one positive thing, which is the, the coming into force of the Escazú Agreement on Earth Day uh, just last week. It is a mechanism that has a whole section that talks about the need to reform access to justice. And hopefully it can also be a place, at least for Latin America and the Caribbean, where their countries can start discussing the need for these rep reforms and how to address criminalization in a more concrete and systematic way. So once again, congrats to IPRE and you know, on this report and hopefully it will allow for really concerted recommendations and action. Thanks very much, Joan. Thanks a lot for that, uh, Carol. I, uh, I think the, the 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 point you made on the, the 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 concept of criminalization and the need for legal reform for access to justice is is really an important uh, point. And by by <laughs> yeah, the the Escasu is another important and milestone legislation that finally uh, is going to uh, further strengthen the hopefully the protection of 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 of, of human rights and 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 environment. So. At least these are the the positive things that uh, that we can look forward in 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 this kind of of, of work that we do. Thank you, uh, Carol. Uh, we I know that we have overtime and 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 thank you for staying on. We we still have uh, Chris Chapman from. Um, from uh, Amnesty in International, and I would like to give the floor to to Chris. I, I I I'm I'm very happy to have you here with us, Chris. Take the floor, Chris. Thanks. Yes. Thanks so much, Joan, uh, and um, thank you, Ipri, for the amazing work you're doing. I'm I'm really honoured to be on the uh, advisory board of Ipri and um, uh, trying to support in whatever way I can and seeing the synergies between Amnesty and IPRI. Um, uh, this report has, I, I think this report's an amazing piece of work. It's so interesting to see the common threads uh, in the situations in the in the six countries, um, and but also the unique aspects of specific situations. Like in Brazil, you have evangelical missionaries entering into the territories of uncontacted peoples. In DRC, people are being arrested for not wearing masks, which they can't even afford. Um, so we have unique situations as well. I, I find it interesting whether there's a common theme between two countries. And I wonder if um, something IPRI might do, for example, what struck me is the similarity between DRC and Colombia and the fact that both indigenous peoples are facing up to um, uh, the threat of armed groups in both of those countries. And would it make sense for IPRI to organize a, a knowledge and strategy share, sharing workshop between activists from, from those two countries? Um, a lot of the themes in the report really echoed with the, with the work that I'm doing. Um, I mean, one case that I've been working on is um, there's a bit of an echo. I don't know if somebody's not muted. Um, it's oh, okay. Or maybe it's me. Okay. Yeah, it's you. Um, it's okay, Chris. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, in Kenya, for example, the government last year organized a moratorium, uh, announced a moratorium on evictions for, because of the pandemic. However, um, they continued to evict indigenous peoples, including the Sengwe, um, yeah. from uh, citing conservation reasons, um, obviously uh, with, with no justification. Um, and it's uh, at the same time, it's incredibly difficult for community uh, activists to engage with government officials because there, there is a ban on meetings. And I feel that this this highlights uh, uh, an impact that we we're not maybe looking at enough, which is the the stress and impact that these measures have on indigenous activists. This works already highly stressful and highly dangerous. If in addition you can't even do your work in an impactful way, you're forced to be in lockdown at home, and your your whole uh, raison d'être, your whole sort of feeling, of your your, your um, uh, reason for, for the work you do, you can't even do it. What psychological impact does that have? And we need these HRDs. We, they, they are vital for their communities. Change will not happen without them. So I wonder, how do we look after Indigenous HRDs in these times? Um, another issue that we've been looking at at Amnesty is it, the involvement in, in indigenous, of Indigenous peoples in decision-making in around facing up to the pandemic. In Ecuador, 
uh, we published an urgent action last year, last year uh, on uh, asking, calling on the Ecuadorian government, which published a protocol about uh, COVID-19 and indigenous Afro-Ecuadorian and Montubio peoples. And indigenous peoples were not even adequately consulted on that protocol. So we issued an urgent action set, uh, calling on the government to, to actually engage with indigenous peoples because, it, you know, nothing with us, uh, nothing about us without us. They, indigenous peoples must be involved in these decisions. Um, in B Bangladesh, another case we've been looking at is that a five star hotel is it being built on the land of an yeah. indigenous Moro people. Um, Human rights monitoring in this area has always been incredibly difficult because the army controls it very yeah. strictly and maintains extremely strict control on who goes in and who, who they can talk to. Obviously, COVID-19 lockdown has made this even more, um, even more serious. And finally, I'd just like to back up what Patrick said about the need to be op optimistic. COVID-19 has exposed in the most dramatic and visible way that we live in a world of systemic discrimination and exclusion where power and money is literally what determines your life chances. You are literally more likely to die because of um, your access to resources and also global governance, how vaccines are being distributed, who gets the vaccine first, which countries get the vaccines first. So this is a key moment where we can call for a radical restructuring of glo global and local governance. And people are listening. If we bring that message, people will be listening to it. So that, that I think we do need to try to keep that optimistic um, uh, outlook in our minds. Thanks very much. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Chris. I, I, your, your suggestion for a knowledge sharing in dealing with armed groups that is exacerbating conflicts and, and attacks and violence in indigenous territories is certainly something that we can consider and perhaps include other countries also that are facing this uh, this kind of, of, of situation. And yeah, and also the positive note that we need to work together for a radical calling for a radical restructuring. That's the, I think the right <laughs> description of what, what needs to be done. Uh, now it's not easy, right? That this will not be that this this will, there's no shortcut, I guess, for this kind of, of, of work because we're dealing with the most powerful institutions. But there, there is hope. There is hope uh, by coming together, working together, building our, our synergies and our solidarity and, and collaboration. And I think this is what also gives us hope uh, in, 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 uh, in pursuing this, uh, this, um, this work that, that, that we do. Uh, we actually have uh, done over time, and but I, I want to thank everybody for for staying on in 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 this uh, side event, and also thanks again to our uh, panel of speakers. Uh, I would just like to, if if the two questions, if there are burning questions from the panelists that they want, I from the participants before we we close. Uh, I see a hand raised. Uh, uh, at the, and it's Siham, Siham from uh, from UNEP. Siham, is there anything you want to add before we close? Yeah, can you can you unmute Siham? Siham, can you hear me? Or oh, another one? It's okay. Siham, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. We hear I'm you. Really sorry, I was on mute. I just wanted, you know, like to really deeply thank you and uh, and all the the panelists and the participants for this amazing, you know, side event. And and I was just like, I just wanted to ask you, you know, like about the EPRI advisory group and how we could, even like as as UNEP, you know, like. Um, like support, you know, like furthermore, you know, like IPRI, you know, we have, as you know, you know, this criminalization on uh, environmental defenders, you know, policy that was just issued. And we are also now working on this interfaith rainforest initiative, whereby we would like to, to put in contact, you know, like uh, to put together actually environmental defenders from faith-based organization, but also from indigenous peoples and local communities. So very happy to discuss with you or any mem any participants of this uh, of this side event about further collaborations. Thank you so much. 
Yeah, thanks a lot for that, Siham, and also thanks for all the efforts from UNEP, you, the, your resolution for the protection of environment defenders. This is very, very important, and we look forward to work with you, uh, Siham. So please be assured that if, I will get in touch with you on this. Uh, we have now, thank you, Siham, we have Donatila Giron. Donatila Giron. Or did I, I hope I pronounced your name right. But any comments, questions, if you have quick questions also to the our speakers that are still here. Uh, talking, can, can uh, I, Ivan, can you unmute? And, and we also have Monica Yator. So I'll just, Hola. if you can, yes. Hola, me escuchan. Hi, do you hear me? Yes, we do. I'm from Honduras, from the okay. Lenca people. And uh, Honduras is not a country that appears in the report. But I would like to share with you our concern from Honduras. We are nine indigenous peoples. So in Honduras, we're also facing the same situation as you, uh, displacement, yeah. land theft, uh, the, co the COVID-19 is making everything worse. And right now we're going through a very difficult situation with COVID. A lot of people are dying and we have almost no vaccine, only 2,500 people have been vaccinated. And at this moment, our Congress has just signed a sort of a agreement with companies so that they can sell the vaccines to us. And we haven't been able to, to get the vaccines in spite of all the, the licenses they have to to exploit our land. So I would like to know if there's a way I can contact IPRI and, yes. and to get help with this. Thank you so much for giving me the floor. Thanks, uh, thanks Don Donatilia. And please be assured of our solidarity with you in these very difficult times that, that you're facing. We'll definitely get in touch with you. My, my colleague, Alan Kai, is from Costa Rica. Uh, so uh, just uh, please share to, uh, yes, we, we, we have your email. So we'll get back to you and, and see, explore what, what we can do. Uh, Monica? Monica? If not... Uh, Monica, okay, and then uh, Severine, uh, I'll, I'll call you later. It seems like there's so many hands now, but yeah. Mo Monica, quickly. Okay, my name is Monica Yator. Uh, I work in a community-based organization in Baringo. I am a human rights defender and also from an indigenous community. I was just wondering how can you support uh, grassroots movement, especially as we are defending women and land rights. So it is difficult for us, especially when there's a lot of threat from the government. Right now, they are grabbing uh, pastoralist land and that those are range lands for pastoralists to, to have uh, grass. So we don't know how can you support our grassroots movement. Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you for that. Uh, Monica, can you kindly tell us again what country you come from? I come from Kenya. Okay, okay. Thanks, thanks. Uh, maybe just to quickly also inform our listeners, IPRI actually have what we call legal and sanctuary fund that, that uh, anyone can apply who are in need of immediate support for, for legal uh, or, or those facing threats. So that is one channel uh, that, that if IPRI can provide uh, support. So uh, in your case, Monica, in case you're, uh, yeah, as you are, you said you're a, a, a land rights defender and if you are facing any threat in your community, uh, please uh, please uh, feel free to approach us and, and, and uh, see if if uh, our legal and sanctuary fund will be able to uh, be used in your in your struggle thank you for thank that you. again monica uh now uh severin any yes yeah, severin severin you are you me? okay thanks so much joan i'm indigenous people from burundi 
and also I'm a coordinator global coordinator of indigenous people global forum for Zunaibro development. Thank you so much uh, for your event about the uh, criminalization of indigenous people. Uh, I would like to ask uh, how I collaborate with the government during these matters uh, on which you work. Uh, the second, your situation of security as indigenous people, human rights defender, how I how how could do manage with this problem. Thanks so much. Okay, uh, I, I, if I get it, uh, thank you for that, Severin. I, if I get it right, your question is about how to manage uh, security of, of indigenous yes. under threat. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll check who among our uh, speakers earlier can respond to that, but maybe just to quickly uh, call on uh, before I ask them, uh, Hamila Hassan, and then followed by Jennifer Nowak before I give it to our speakers, and then we close. So, uh, Hamila? Jamila, thank you. It's Jamila. <laughs> okay, Jamila. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, my concern is, uh, well, for years I have seen how uh, uh, victimized and criminalized my people have gone through. Yet, uh, whenever um, we try to approach uh, justice, we never uh, seem to get it, no matter what. And um, most times, uh, whenever the, the media reports, the narrative always goes against us. So I feel so hopeless and uh, I, I, I kind of uh, feel despair about these issues. But then my hope is uh, seeing um, the, from the, at, at the global level, uh, I just want to see some kind of uh, justice being actualized in with regards to indigenous people. Uh, uh, at least maybe it will give me some kind of hope and then I will come forward and begin to seek for solutions uh, through IPRI. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jamila. Uh, I'll pass on to the speakers later to, to respond to your uh, point uh, on on the issue of uh, access to justice at the global level. And Jennifer, if Jennifer, quickly, do you have question or comments? Jennifer? Jennifer, no work? Okay. If... Jennifer. Okay. Um, okay. Um, Hello? Okay, I think it's, uh, um, okay, so, hello? Hello. No, I think there's a technical problem, but because we're really uh, doing much over time, uh, can I request any of the speakers? to respond quickly to the question on the issue of security, how can we provide security to, to uh, human rights defenders and uh, also the issue of accessing justice at the global level. Anyone any who wants to just uh, among the panelists, raise your hands or, or um, speak, speak out so I can call you. Anyone who wants to respond to that? Nobody. <laughs> I don't see any uh, any reaction uh, on on these uh, questions, but I, I believe the the issue of the providing security at the for human rights defenders is a very uh, tricky and uh, challenging as 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 we've seen. But it it really depends on the context on what possible action can can be done uh, at least to minimize the the risk that indigenous peoples are are facing. And in 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 some communities, they have uh, adapted their own security measures to say protect their own leaders like. Uh, 
uh, providing them with uh, as acting as e escorts. They they choose what they uh they they just don't go anywhere without no one knowing where they're going. So there are some uh, security measures that has been developed. And uh, Jamila, your question on the on the access to justice at the global level. Actually, uh, Patrick. Um, referred to this that that this is something that we can possibly explore at the at the at the global level uh in using in including using the international criminal court uh as, as a possible uh option to to seek justice not to to victims and there are also other ways in terms of uh making it mandatory for companies uh to respect human rights and that they be held accountable when they violate the rights of indigenous people so these are uh possible um, uh, efforts or mechanisms at the global level where we can uh, have access to, to justice. Uh, so again, uh, I think we've really uh, reached the end of this um, uh, event. Uh, and I, I hope and I would encourage you feel free to download the report of, of IPRI and also feel free to get in touch with us uh, with IPRI. Uh, our, our email is, is there, our contact address is, is there. And we hope and we look forward to continuing collaboration and cooperation and building solidarity uh, and partnership with, with you in our common effort uh, and initiative to address the issue of criminalization of and impunity against indigenous people. So uh, again, I would like to thank the, the, our speakers, our partners, uh, uh, our board members, and also the, from the advisory group the, that has joined us in this event and also my colleagues at, at IPRI uh, who actually were the ones who put together the, the report and also in organizing this event. So thank you. And also I want to thank our interpreters uh, for joining us and staying on. Sorry for your overtime, but uh, I, I thank you for, for your work. And uh, good if, good day or good evening, good good morning or good noon to everyone. Thank you. And please, again, feel free to get in touch with us uh, at IPRI. Thank you.